Ladies and gentlemen, in this Red Gaming Tetacom video, let's discuss Intel's Broadwell U-CPU, shall we? It seems like a good idea, considering they've just announced them at CES 2015. In fact, they've an announced a rather large plethora of the CPUs, and these range all the way from the Celerons up to the i7s, but these are not quite the CPUs that gamers would be expecting. Instead, they are for low-power devices such as notebooks, um, rather than high performance desktops to give you an idea they sport a power consumption of just 15 to 28 watts depending on the dual core CPU in question you might have even noticed the phrase dual core CPU rather than say quad or whatever um, and that that's going to kind of give you an idea of what we're discussing here so it's a bit odd because these 14, the 14nm 14 architecture is rather impressive. It is a massive die shrink and we're even seeing massive improvement in the amount of transistors. To give you an idea, the fourth generation, the U series, had 1.3 billion transistors while the fifth generation, in other words Broadwell U, sports 1.9 billion, which is, you know, pretty impressive and all. But for us PC gamers, we're probably going to be waiting for some time. In fact, Intel are giving us a rough release date of mid-2015, in other words, mid this year. This becomes even more confusing when we factor in the fact that Skylake, at least according to what we're hearing from motherboard manufacturers, is going to be released about the same point time. In fact, some are actually saying it's going to be unveiled at Computex, which is supposedly, um, well, supposedly anyway, unveiled at Computex, which is going to be in uh, June this year. If that's the case, Sky Lake and uh, Broadwell are going to be released at pretty similar times to one another, which is mighty odd indeed. And we'll just have to see what happens in regards to the technology and how the two processes can coexist. The other thing that's confusing to a lot of gamers right now, and people in general, in other words consumers, is that if you were to look, you've got i7s which are dual core, which obviously that's not the case for desktop, and Intel are even getting a bit guilty of doing this for the desktop as well. For example, we've got i5s which are dual core, when originally all i5s, it was pretty safe to say i3s are dual core with hyper threading i5s are, well, quad-cores, and then i7s are quad-cores with hyper-threading enabled. It was a very simplistic way to describe things to people. Now, Intel's starting to muddy that a little bit, particularly with these ultra-low power devices. Now, their thoughts and opinions on this is pretty simple. Their idea is that, well, you know, they're different, they're different lines, they're different product lines at the end of the day, and so on. And that's one way to look at it, but I do think it does add a little bit of complication, particularly for those customers that don't quite know so much and haven't done their research. They're going to look at a processor on the desktop and say, oh, okay, that's exactly the same thing. I would prefer them to have a bit of a deviation. I know they've got the U there, but still, most people don't really think what you know one letter is going to make the difference, which is a bit you know weird. So what are we left with? Well, I, I pretty much could summarize it like this. There is some large improvements on the processing performance of these pro of these uh, CPUs up to about 22%, supposedly, if you believe Intel's numbers and they're telling them to anyone who will listen. And that's great and all, but it doesn't mean a jot for us as PC gamers. What it does mean, however, is that if you're wanting to buy an ultra-thin x86-based tablet and you might do in say the next couple of months theoretically manufacturers will be able to release them with lower power consumption which means that we'll be able to get better screen displays richer screen displays higher resolution and of course a longer battery life all of which is great news and the other thing naturally these processors have high levels of performance which means that games will run a little better as well which might be good for mobile gaming but if you don't give a crap about mobile gaming, which is fair enough, I personally don't really do it myself that often, I have a tablet, which I rarely touch for games, you know, I use it for web browsing, that's pretty much it, not really into mobile gaming at all, then you're going to be waiting, um, and you're probably going to be waiting till mid next, sorry, mid this year. So if, if you're basically an owner of a good CPU, let's assume that you're an owner of, say, a Sandy Bridge, say 2500K, in other words, a decently cocked processor, 
probably better just to wait at this point for Skylake. That's just my feeling. Obviously, we'll have to wait for the actual reviews. We'll have to wait for the actual, you know, benchmarks to really start coming in. Um, so, obviously, stick with us for that. But until then, it's looking like this fifth generation shrink is mostly going to, at the moment, benefit the mobile market. And us PC gamers, it's not really going to mean too much. So, anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the relatively short video. I'll see you soon. Take care and bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.